wonders. So that's a wonderful thing to remember that um, it's amazing that we are very quick to um, compliment God, to praise God about what he has done in our lives and the blessings that he gives. It is also good, though, to remember that there are, that are, there are things that God does that we can't even comprehend that um, maybe not even directly impact us, but yet he does such wonderful things in our lives and in the lives of others that we should be reminded of. Let's go ahead and pr uh, I already prayed, but uh, let's pray again. Heavenly, F uh, you know, yeah, let's go ahead and read it together. I did not specify that. Heavenly Father, you are faithful to us. We get scared by the lies the devil tells us. We are trapped in our sin. Thank you for delivering us from the den of death and giving us new life. Jesus, in his name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, we'll go ahead and try to see if we can get the video working here with audio. That's the one part I'm kind of worried about. One of the wonderful things about the Christian faith is that, especially when we read our Bible, nothing just kind of happens. That it's amazing that, it, especially, there are many points in the Bible that reflect each other. That, uh, that almost it, it, you have an echo of what has occurred and something extremely similar happens, or maybe it, it's an even an actual reflection. So in, in, the, in uh, movies, in TV shows, uh, a lot, in dramas, a lot of times what ends up happening is that you're, you'll have a moment, in, especially if it's some kind of series, you'll have a moment where it reflects uh, something happened and then something very similar happens uh, later in the show or the movies. Uh, I will gladly admit that I'm a big Star Wars fan. Uh, um, I don't know if you would call me a Star Wars nerd, uh, but I definitely enjoy Star Wars. One of the, uh, in one of the interviews that George Lucas was giving um, when he was talking about Star Wars, he was talking about this kind of concept of a kind of reflecting uh, that his movies have moments in them that reflect one another. So the movies that he uh, created back in the in the late 70s, early 80s, they have moments in them that actually will reflect with what he made in the early 2000s. I think I think there's a lot, uh, or I think why directors and 
writers, why there are so many times in movies that this happens is because of the fact that it is something that is very naturally occurring because of the fact that in the, Bi it, in the Bible, that's how creation was set up, to reflect each other, to have moments that look very similar. And we'll, we have a story here of Daniel that somewhat reflects our Lord's death and resurrection. Uh, just from a, a little quote here, God's people lived in the promised land, and the, now this is kind of moving back to the biblical narrative. Until after repeated warnings from God to repent, enemy armies plundered the land and took many of them into exile, including Daniel. Daniel lived and served under multiple kings, and God blessed his work. God was faithful to Daniel and kept him safe from godless leaders and many dangers. If, uh, you might know a little about uh, Daniel, just kind of from this and from different parts. Maybe you probably know a couple people a little more that Daniel interacted with. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, that's probably a story that you have heard before, that they, they were in a pretty similar situation with Daniel, that uh, the order came from Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, that everybody should worship only the king, and they didn't. So they were thrown into a fiery furnace, and yet they were spared. They didn't have a, any charring on them. Uh, and there was a fourth figure, a um, pre-incarnate Christ, was with them and protected them. And here's, once again, another moment when a, uh, a man who has done nothing wrong... Who, ha who only wants to worship the Lord our God is pretty much given an execution notice and was spared, not because of his own well-being, but because of God working in the midst of this. And we kind of, this, this is a huge jump. I, I will admit this. It is a huge jump to go from talking about David last week to talking, and, you know, Goliath. Uh, and talking about how God delivered his people. It's a huge jump to go from David to Daniel, but I can pretty much fill it in, and I, I talked a little of the, about this in my sermon, that pretty much what happened in between is that it just went downhill for God's people. Yes, David was a very flawed king. He, at times, relied on his own army's strength, and his military experience rather than God's, and he was punished for it. David thought he could get away with anything, which is when he decided to, uh, have, uh, to have the affair with Bathsheba, and he was punished greatly for that. David, and then at the end of his life, David was not allowed to build the temple um, that the people, even in David's time, were still worshiping in the tent, in the tabernacle. David was not allowed to build the temple because of there was just too much blood on his hands. Yes, it was um, God's charge to David to defend the kingdom and to reclaim the land that God had promised the people of Israel, but it wasn't David's job to build the temple. After David, though, you have Solomon, and Solomon was a overall, I mean, in our standards, he was a pretty good king. He built the temple as he was commanded by God. And then he built his own royal palace, uh, which is always funny to think about because um, imagine the president of the United States, not, we don't need to uh, like use actual names, but just the president of the United States. Imagine the president of the United States going, you know what, I don't think the White House is big enough. Let's make it a 12-story mansion made out of gold, uh, all the pools that I could imagine, you know, give me a nice um, hair salon so, you know, I can, I can look real nice and make the wife happy, uh, build a full golf course in the middle of the house, a full basketball court. Well, okay, maybe some of that is unrealistic, but that's what Solomon did, that it, it was kind of, it, I don't know if you want to say it's a weird move, 
but it's definitely a move that they built a very luxurious palace for the king. And did, uh, Solomon moved in there, but that's not all Solomon did. We knew know that there was peace under Solomon, that um, Solomon had great wisdom uh, when the two women came to him and needed help to figure out whose baby it was. It was Solomon who, uh, by the grace of God, who had the wisdom to do that. The Queen of Sheba even came to Solomon to, to see his wonders and his greatness and his wisdom. But then Solomon fell into the trap of not, of, um, well, I don't know how do you want to describe this. First off, Solomon fell into the trap of not worshiping the Lord our God and only the Lord our God. The second trap he fell into is the trap that I'm very thankful that um, men these days don't have to worry about, that uh, Solomon decided to take on over 700 wives and concubines. Uh, I am blessed and thankful with one wife. Holy cow, Solomon, what are you thinking? Uh, That's all I'm going to say on that department. If I was a wife who shared a husband with 700 other women, I would be offended by that. And then, and then the other question is for you women out there. Man, your husband, you have to deal with your husband. Thank goodness, you know, you only have to have one husband. Because, man, uh, I, I think you have enough children in your household, including your husband. You don't need to add to that. Uh, eh. the, bi- the big thing, though, I mean, beyond... Um, Beyond what we know, obviously know that we are called one man, one woman, one husband, one wife. You know, that is the charge that we have been given. And that's a good thing because we are one flesh with those whom we marry. Um, obviously, Solomon, by doing that, there's no way he could do that. Um, there's no possible way. There's no way he could provide. I mean, as a king, yeah, he could provide for all of his children, but man, how do you, you are, there's no way he could be a good husband. Or especially to one, to two, but to over 700, there's no way that could happen. So, and then what ends up happening is that Solomon's wives, they were not all Jewish. They were all, they weren't all Israelite. They didn't all worship Yahweh. And Solomon, wanting to, you know, do different things with his wives, starts to worship other gods. And even though that God, God did make the promise to David that the scepter would not leave his descendants. Immediately after David is off the throne, God already tells Solomon, man, you already screwed the pooch on this one pretty bad, didn't you? And God takes away 10 of the northern tribes from the line of David. Uh, But he waits until Solomon has died and Solomon's son, Rehoboam, takes the throne. And uh, Rehoboam is given a charge of either um, raising taxes or lowering taxes, either being a nice king or or a very cruel king. And he takes the advice of his younger, less wise attendants and uh, the people rebel against him. And Jeroboam, and that's always the fun part about that part, Rehoboam was in the south, Jeroboam was in the north. Jeroboam takes the northern tribes, only Judah and Benjamin are left with uh, the line of David. And from there, the tri- or the, the, uh, the northern tribes, they never had a good king. They had a good earthly king, but they did not have a king that ever set after God. And, I mean, each, it it is very sad to read because every time a new king is introduced in the Bible, they're always introduced pretty much in the same way. Uh, Jeroboam II was the son of Omari. He ruled in Samaria for 
25 years, and then it always, so it kind of mentions who their dad was, how long they ruled, and then did they follow after God. And in the northern tribes, each and every time, each king was said, uh, their uh, heart was wicked in the eyes of God. And they, did, they, they kept following into the same sins as their fathers, which was not worshiping God and God alone, which resulted in the northern tribes being taken away. And that's where the word Samaritans comes from, because if you ever wonder, like, where did Samaritans come from in the New Testament? Samaritans come from kind of a, uh, a mixed race between Gentiles and Jews, uh, the, northern, the northern tribes, where, um, and they all settled back in around the, the town of Samaria, Samaria ending up being the capital of the northern tribes of Israel. Uh, so I, I would encourage you to kind of read about that. That's, you, you'll find a lot about more about the northern tribes in the book in the in first and second kings. It can I get it. It can kind of get a little boring saying, you know, Pekka ruled this one, he was wicked in the eyes of God, he did this, he died, his son took over. But it is a wonderful reminder of how we can trace how sin is hard to get rid of. That sin dwells not just from man to man, but generation to generation, and th that there, there is true, a true actual punishments for sin. And then the southern tribes, uh, yeah, they had, they had a lot of kings that were very faithful to God. They had uh, Jehoshaphat, they had uh, Hezekiah, they had Josiah, they, they had multiple really good kings, but the problem was they had other kings that tore people away from God, that offered more, offered more worship to other gods that would take people away from God. There was even a, a, a king of Judah uh, named Manasseh that you normally hear about uh, who did, pr who pretty much he was the king where God said, nope, I'm done. There's no coming back from it. They're going into exile. They, they're getting out of my land. Uh, you normally hear about, like, child sacrifice. Uh, you know, you, you'll, you, if you hear about child sacrifice for, like, worship, you'll probably hear it from maybe, like, a Central American, uh, Native American tribe, like the, uh, the Mayans. Uh, you know, you might hear, well, it got so bad under Manasseh's reign that they were offering child sacrifices to these pagan gods in Jerusalem. And even the Bible even mentions that Jerusalem, like the blood from these sacrifices was just flowing in the streets of Jerusalem. Now imagine being God, having your presence in the city that you call holy and blood spilling in the streets because of child sacrifices to other pagan gods. You think God was pretty happy with that? <laughs> nope. Which is why he sent them into exile. Which is kind of where we pick up uh, with Daniel. And Daniel living in a completely different country, which is why a faithful, a faithful Israelite is living in a completely different country and serving a completely different king. <clears throat> we have here Daniel chapter 6. Um, would it be better for me to read this, or would somebody, would, would somebody like to read? I'll read for you, Pastor. Thank you, Kevin. You want the church finished, the whole thing? If you, if you want to, and I'll, I'll keep going through the slides. If, if Queen Darius has set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps could give account, so that the king might suffer no loss.
Thank you, Kevin. And yes, they definitely did. Going back <coughs> real quick, uh, this, is a, no, this is a good translation. Nothing wrong with this translation. But I'll tell you, I, I, uh, this morning, I don't know why, but I was, the, the other translation that we're using in worship uh, used presidents. And I, I, I just got thrown off. I'm, I'm, I keep looking down at this word. I'm like, presidents. Pre presidents? I don't know, for some reason, hearing the word president in the Bible just really didn't, like, click. Um, but oh well. The, you always have a moment um, when you're reading the word of God where you go, what is that word? And then you go, you, you have the number one rule uh, that you learn in seminary. If you are not quite sure what the word is, just say it confidently and say it the same every time and nobody will notice. So a couple things up here um, that I, I want to point out. Um, so you're looking at like the, the hundred satraps and the officials. This, is, this isn't just some dinky backwater nation. We're talking about at the time the most powerful nation on earth. This is the same uh, Persian nation that if you, uh, if you know anything about Greek history, the same um, nation that the Greeks went up against. So, for example, if the movie uh, 300 with uh, Gerard Butler, I think. I, I think if I'm thinking of the right movie. Uh, that's the same nation that we're talking about here. And so this is a far-reaching nation, very powerful nation. And in it, Daniel is a very high official. But yet in this, the, high, the other high officials were jealous because of the fact that imagine a foreigner, someone who is not a, a natural born citizen of your country, not a kin, is the right hand man of the king, and you know that's not gonna that's not gonna fly. They don't like that. I mean, why should they? That they should King Darius should probably listen to somebody you know that is actually from Persia. You know who has no allegiances but to Persia because. At the end of the day, who, uh, and this is the same question that we are asked. Just as we are, who was Daniel's greatest allegiance to? God. It is something as we as Americans, um, <clears throat> and not just Americans, anybody who lives in America, Mexico, Canada, Germany, UK, China, Switzerland, everywhere in the country, for any Christian, we have to truthfully and honestly say, we can have allegiance to our country, and it's a good thing to have an allegiance to our country, but our first allegiance has to be to God, and nothing can come in between that. So in his um, duties, Daniel, yes, he could have an allegiance to, for the well-being and the perseverance of Persia, but nothing could come between him and God, and they the officials of Persia used that as a, uh, as a weapon against him. And uh, a couple things here from verse 6. Uh, this phrase will come back up, O King Darius, live forever. It is an interesting note here for the fact that um, you have this phrase, the, oh, live forever, that it, they, they wanted to show respect and honor to a king. However, as we know, uh, you know, they're almost giving, um, uh, it's a sign, either sh show of respect, as Daniel might give, or a sign of, hey, we kind of want to see you as a divinity, as these high officials might be doing. Uh, that, might, that is just me speculating from 2,500 years afterward. But it is just a reminder that, yes, as we can show respect to any government official, to any king, that um, we all are going to die unless Jesus comes back. Now, they get this injunction on, uh, I don't, I'm not sure where the 30 days come from. I guess probably for them, uh, you know, they didn't, to, to catch Daniel in that trap, they didn't need that long. You know, they, they only needed a couple days, and what do you know? 
he signed the petition, and uh, I, I'm not quite sure of the governmental structure of Persia, but it almost did sound like that King Darius was uh, uh, accountable to his people because of the fact that his governmental officials came to him and said, you really need to do this. Now, what came over Daniel? Maybe pride did come over the fact that he wanted to be the one who's shown recognition, honor, and respect above all. Uh, but he was still brought, it was brought forth to him. So, um, while not directly mentioned, you, you can see the devil's work in this. That evil is working behind the scenes to get people to want to worship anything other than the one true God. Kevin, do you mind keeping reading for me here? When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, Thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's the, I mean, for a high governmental official for Daniel, for him not to know, like that's not a thing. He would he would have known, and he chose to ignore it and to say by conscience, saying I can't follow this law. I have to worship the Lord our God. Now, I, and I was talking about kind of the parallels and the, and the reflections that happen with each other. Uh, but, uh, oh gosh, I'm trying to find it here. I think it might be in Luke, uh, but they were urgent. I can't, I can't quite find the right passage. But there is a gospel passage where uh, pretty much that Jesus is in front of Pilate, and they're all in front of the crowd, and uh, pretty much the cr uh, Pilate wants to let Jesus go. And he's wanting to let, uh, you know, he's not finding any Roman law that he's breaking. But the, uh, the Jewish officials are very adamant, saying this man has sworn that he will, um, you know, overthrow, and he's a direct, uh, he's calling himself God. When, you know, when uh, the only God is supposed to be Caesar, is it not? It was, a, it was pretty much the Jewish officials doing the same thing as the Persian officials, using law and using politics for an end goal, for their own benefit. So while Darius didn't want to throw Daniel in the lion's den, to be a good ruler... Because as soon as rulers, I mean, because, I mean, look at it uh, for, especially for, for those in the room that have seen multiple presidents in your lifetime, regardless of what political party, no matter uh, the background of the president, no matter what the policies are of the president, and that's the big thing, no matter the policies of the president, when the president says, I, and this is just president, this is mayors, governors. When any elected official says, I am going to do this, and then they do the complete opposite. True or false, you lose trust in the official. Yeah, Darren. Yeah. 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 Yeah, precisely. Daniel wasn't going to change. Daniel wasn't going to go into hiding with his faith because of the fact that, you know, Daniel could have changed his practices, that he could have, um, 
he could have just prayed in the middle of the night, or he could have just prayed in secret and in hiding. But instead, Daniel keeps the same practices that he always does, which is why, uh, let me see if I don't if then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Why did they? Why were they able to find him? Because he was doing the same thing. They already knew his practices. He already. They already knew what he was going to do at what time and when and where. It is. Um, it also is a kind of a reminder of what happens a little before in the book of Daniel when you talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When how were the Babylonian um, officials able to point out Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Well, everybody was, everybody was told to bow to the king of Babylon, and what do you know? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are right out in the open doing what they would normally have done, probably showing respect to their king, but they weren't going to bow to him and worship him. It, it is an amazing thing that we have um, those who have gone before us in the faith that we ha they are um, men and women that we look up to because we, underst because we have an example of how we stand up for our faith in a, world that, in a world that has always been sinful since Adam and Eve uh, sinned in the garden, going back to our tree of life, that we're, we're just trying to get back to, we're just trying to get back to Eden, being able to, to walk with our God without worry, without doubt, without fears. And for Daniel, he wasn't going to live in fear. Would anybody besides Kevin like to read or give others a chance? <laughs> well, I, Clay, would you like to read or would you like to, did you have a comment? Okay, go ahead. We'll give Kevin a break. He's doing great. Go ahead, Clay. reflections, parallels that we're talking about, it is, ama excuse me, it is amazing that in the Old Testament, Daniel came out of the den and there was someone to greet him, someone who was excited, who was glad to see him. Parallel that to the New Testament. And imagine the sheer delight and joy that the women in the garden faced when they got to the tomb and they were told he is not here. He has risen. When Mary was at the tomb and she saw Jesus with her own eyes and she cried out, my Lord and my God. It is a joy to be able to see how they align up. The joys of coming out of death into life. Because there was nothing for Daniel in that den except death. There was nothing for Jesus and for us in that tomb but death. But coming out is life. 
and life everlasting. I'm not sure, Kevin. That I th uh Oh yeah, there. I would probably say to make sure that it is child appropriate that they they go. Eh, we don't really need to mention that part, but yeah, I mean that is a good point that the that um, that out of this new life for Daniel, uh, that those who were in error, who were in wrong, who were in sin, were punished. Yeah, I mean that is a. That's a cool parallel with what when Christ comes back, that there's a parallel that those who belong with Christ in the tomb will be raised from the dead. Those who are outside in accusation will be thrown into the thrown into the pit forever. A couple of like as I was mentioning, kind of the little the background around it. This happened around 500 BC, so it happened about you know 500 years before Jesus walked the earth. Uh, this is only around. 50 to maybe 100 years, eh, about, probably about 50, 75 years before the intercessory period, which is the time between the Old and New Testament. So it, this definitely is, a, like this is, you know, there's not a lot left in the Old Testament history before it skips forward into the New Testament period. Uh, and a couple facts about Daniel and Darius. Uh, the, pre the president, that's, I think that's the ESV um, usage, and then the satraps. Uh, so a little background on that. Uh, a couple questions let's get into. Uh, we don't have a ton of time, but we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, and we've kind of covered this a little, but I would still love to hear them. Uh, in verses 1 to 9, what are the reasons the other leaders were out to get Daniel? What did they say about Dan what did that say about Daniel's character? So what were they saying about Daniel? Yes, Mr. Brown. Yeah, that they cared so much about their own position in the nation in the kingdom that they were afraid of Daniel. So uh, it, it, it was completely, it wasn't, it wasn't some way of, um, I am sorry, my phone decided it started to want to play random music. Uh, it wasn't done because Daniel was a wicked person. It was, they weren't doing it because Daniel um, was harming the nation. It was on the contrary. Daniel was helping the nation. God was blessing the nation because of men like Daniel and that they did not like it and that they wanted power for their own because what happens to humanity when humanity has power, power corrupts. And they, without God, they wanted that influence and power that Daniel had. But then what does that say about Daniel? Because if you notice, Daniel Daniel's words were not, I don't even think Daniel even talks in this passage until he comes out of the lion's den. What does that say about Daniel that he does not even, his voice is not even, he does not even raise his voice against them. And that all you know about Daniel, he worships God, then he comes out of the den. What does that say about Daniel? Yeah that he was trusting God, that Daniel wasn't going to fall into the same trap that those men were, that Daniel wasn't going to act like other, uh, the rest of humanity, that he is going to act like one of God's children. He's not going to cause harm to anybody else. He is not going to disrespect anyone. He's not going to try to get any more power for himself. He is going to let God be in charge and to focus on God alone. Uh, I mean, I, I think that kind of answers the same uh, same thing about uh, Daniel's choice. That he, uh, I, I guess, here's a big thing. Um, 
what were all of Daniel's, Daniel's choices in this matter? What, what are the, give me everything that Daniel could have done in this situation. Yeah. I can, I can see the, I can see the parallel. Um, you know, Jesus and Daniel both could have stood up and said, "Nah, I, this isn't right. This is, this is wrong." Um, but silence means putting it all in God's hands. And yeah, I mean, I do see that parallel. Are we calling Daniel um, God or a Christ figure? No, but we are, we are, and we are recognizing that you know there. There are examples of what Christ would be, and I, Kevin, as you mentioned, I think that's a wonderful example of the parallel between the two. Uh, so, but, you know, tell me, tell me every choice, though, that Daniel could have had in this moment. What are all the things Daniel could have done? Just shout them out. Could have followed the law. Vacation sounds pretty good to me in any situation. That sounds like a pretty good one there. Yep, he could have gone on vacation. He could have not fallen the law. Uh, what, can you think of another one? Oh, okay, yeah, he could have pretty much could have just shut everything off and not had to worry about it. Yep. What would you say there, Kevin? Pretty quietly. Pretty quietly, yeah. Yeah. He could have just said, all right, fine, I'm not going to worry about God, you know. He, I, he's not going to help me in this situation. Why, why should I worship him? Um, he could have all, Daniel could have also acted like another corrupt official. He could, have, he could have used his political authority and got all those guys killed for trying to get him killed. He could have done, he could have done any of those things. And yet, I think that shows a lot about his character for the fact that he didn't do any of those. He just did the same exact thing and worshipped our God. Well, also, it shows what kind of power God has. So that's what he came out of the den and went home. Yeah. He was like bold. Yeah. God must have good stuff and everybody starts praising God. Well, precisely. Look at Daniel was shut in the den with killers. Lions aren't. So, like I mentioned in my sermon, there aren't some cuddly cat that you're going to bring into your own home. It's not, we're not watching the Lion King around here and watching lions um, sing these musicals and then get a little Elton John in the background. These are trained killers who kill for their food, who are designed uh, to be able to kill other animals. And yet, you're telling me, I don't know how many lions were in that den, but you're telling me multiple lions not, over maybe a 12-hour period, none of them ever got hungry? None of them ever went looking at Daniel and went, man, that's a pretty, pretty good-looking midnight snack to me. No. It mentions in our passage that God shut their mouths, that they were unable, they it's not even that they weren't even hungry, and it was by chance. They, were in, they did not have the capability of harming Daniel because God was protecting Daniel in this moment. A couple other things about um, kind of what the, it shows in the text about being God's people. Like Daniel, all of God's people are called upon to be faithful even in the face of danger and to trust that God is in control in the end, in our world today, um, this is a this is a pretty easy way of connecting, um, especially uh, Christian martyrs all around the world. That there are so many people who are facing persecution and martyrdom for the faith that they refuse to give up the faith in times of persecution, and that what we as Christians today have the joy and opportunity to not only look back at Daniel for an example, but look at those who are like Daniel today, who, who, are, who refuse to change their habits and beliefs and only worship the Lord our God. And then 
uh, it's another wonderful reminder for the fact that we do not change our habits as being Christians for the world. The, w the world has to deal with Christians and our habits. I'm not saying we're better than the rest of the world. I'm not saying our uh, world view, our, our actions and our faith should be forced upon the world. What I'm saying is that we have specific moments that we are called to be Christians and to be unapologetic about it and to keep the practice and traditions of our church. Uh, perfect example, Sunday morning. The rest of the world is starting to, you know, not just starting, it's definitely happening when Sundays are no longer sacred. Fine. Whatever. It's not the rest of the world's job to keep Sunday sacred. That's our job. And for those, you know, who maybe have to work on Sundays, not just Sundays, but the day that is worship, because we worship on Monday nights as well. So whatever day we worship, we're called, we as Christians are called by our God to keep it holy, not for the world to, or not to expect the rest of the world to keep it holy. Like Daniel, all of God's people are surrounded by enemies who desire to destroy us. The ancient enemies of God's people are the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh. A reminder, we have adversaries, which is why we are called to return to the Lord our God and to be together, to be defended and to guard against those ancient enemies. And that God's people will not always be delivered from physical harm like Daniel, but we are delivered from eternal destruction by the cross of Christ, which is why that they are parallel, but they are not the exact same thing. Daniel was physically saved by God um, in the den. We are eternally saved by Christ from his resurrection from the tomb. And then kind of getting into the how does God interact with the world. God is not distant from his people. He is with them throughout the journeys in, his li in life. God is with us. We are in God's story that goes from eternity to eternity. When we look at the world in this way, God is with us, and we understand that God's never going to abandon us because God has, does not want to leave his story because his story involves you and me. And the Bible is not a fairy tale. It is rooted in actual human history. God is involved in human history. He has directed the course of events to serve his purpose of bringing Christ into the world. I always like to, uh, one of my favorite verses I like to uh, quote, especially in times like this, is Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. In many, in various ways, God spoke to the people of old by his prophets. God did miraculous work through the prophets and things like this. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God works differently than he did in the Old Testament. But God is working through Christ for our redemption, for our benefit. Anybody, thoughts or questions? Well, let's go ahead and let's end with the, Bi the Bible verse to remember and then a prayer. The Bible verse. You are the God who works wonders. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, Heavenly Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, we give you thanks for the reminder of Daniel and for what you did for him. Let us be unapologetic about our faith that we may be faithful to you and serve our neighbors faithfully, that we focus on nothing but you, and all of our relationships and vocations flow from the service and devotion to you. Bless the, our weeks that we may be beneficial in our vacations and serve you faithfully and to cherish you in all that we do. In your most holy and precious name, amen. amen. God's blessings on your week. We will see you either, either at the 1030 service or we will see you next week.